Well, hello, my sweet babies. Hope everybody's had a good day, ready for a good story. So tonight I'm reading out of Percy Jackson and the Olympians. So this was written by Rick Riordan, uh, and this is volume one. It's called The Lightning Thief. So are you ready, Gavin? Okay, we're going to start on page one, chapter one. The name of this chapter is called, I Accidentally Vaporized My Pre-Algebra Teacher. Look, I didn't want to be a half-blood. If you're reading this because you think you might be one, my advice is close this book right now. Believe whatever lie your mom and dad told you about your birth and try to lead a normal life. Being a half-blood is dangerous. It's scary. Most of the time it gets you killed in painful, nasty ways. If you're a normal kid reading this because you think it's a great fiction, read on. I envy you for being able to believe that none of this ever happened. But if you recognize yourself in these pages, if you feel something stirring inside, stop reading immediately. You might be one of us. And once you know that, it's only a matter of time before they sense it too. And they'll come for you. Don't say I didn't warn you. My name is Percy Jackson. I am 12 years old. Until a few moments ago, I was boarding student at Yancey Academy, a private school for troubled kids in upstate New York. Am I a trouble kid? Yeah, you could say that. I could start at any point in my short, miserable life to prove it, but things really started going bad last May when our sixth grade class took a field trip to Manhattan. 28 mental case kids and two teachers on a yellow bus heading to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to look at ancient Greek and Roman stuff. <coughs> I know it sounds like torture. Most Yancey field trips were. But Mr. Bruner, our Latin teacher, was leading this trip, so I had some hopes. Mr. Bruner was the middle-aged guy in a motorized wheelchair. He had thinning hair and a scruffy beard and a frayed tweed jacket, and it always smelled like coffee. You wouldn't think he'd be cool, but he told stories and jokes, and he let us play games in class. He also had this awesome collection of Roman armor and weapons, so he was the only teacher whose class didn't put me to sleep. I hoped the trip would be okay. At least I hoped that for once, I wouldn't get in trouble. Boy, was I wrong. See, bad things happen to me on field trips. Like at my fifth grade school, when we went to Saratoga Battlefield, I had this accident with a Revolutionary War cannon. I wasn't aiming for this school bus, but of course I got expelled anyway. And before that, at my fourth grade school, when we took a behind the scenes tour of the Marine World Shark Pool, I sort of hit the wrong lever on the catwalk and our class took an unplanned swim. And the time before that, well, you get the idea. This trip, I was determined to be good. All the way into the city, I put up with Nancy Bobo Fit, the freckly redheaded kleptomaniac girl, hitting my best friend Grover in the back of the head with clunks of peanut butter and ketchup sandwich. Grover was an easy target. He was scrawny. He cried when he got frustrated. He must have been held back several grades because he was the only sixth grader with acne and the start of a wispy beard on his chin. On top of that, he was crippled. He had a note excusing him for PE for the rest of his life because he had some kind of weird muscular disease in his legs. He walked funny, like every step hurt him. But don't let that fool you. You should see him run when it, it was enchilada day in the cafeteria. Anyway, Nancy Bobo Fett was throwing wads of sandwich that stuck in his curly brown hair and she knew I couldn't do anything back to her because I was already on probation. The headmaster had threatened me with death by in-school suspension if anything bad, embarrassing, or even mildly entertaining happened on this trip. I'm going to kill her, I mumbled. Grover tried to calm me down. It's okay, I like peanut butter. He dodged another piece of Nancy's lunch. That's it, I started to get up, but Grover pulled me back down to my seat. You're already on probation, he reminded me. You know we'll get blamed if anything happens. Looking back on it, I wish I'd decked Nancy Bobo fit right then and there. In-school suspension would have been nothing compared to the mess I got myself into. Mr. Bruner led the museum tour. He rode up front in his wheelchair, guiding us through the big echoey galleries, past marble statues and glass, glass cases full of really old black and orange pottery. In my mind, that this stuff had survived for 2,000, 2,000 to 3,000 years, it blew my mind. He gathered us around a 13-foot-tall stone column with a big sphinx on the top 
and started telling us how it was a great marker, a steal for a girl about our age. He told us about the carvings on the side. I was trying to listen to what he had to say, but it was kind of interesting, but everybody around me was talking. And every time I told them to shut up, the other teacher, chaperone, Mrs. Dodds, she'd give me the evil eye. Mrs. Dodds was this little math teacher from Georgia who always wore a black leather jacket, even though she was 50 years old. She looked mean enough to ride a Harley right into your locker. She had, she had come to Yancey halfway through the year with our last math teacher had a nervous breakdown. From her first day, Mrs. Dodds loved Nancy Bobo Fit, and I figured I was the devil's spawn. She would point her crooked finger at me and say, now honey, real sweet, and I knew I was going to get after school attention for a month. One time, after she made me erase answers out of an old math workbook until midnight, I told Grover I didn't think Mrs. Dodds was human. He looked at me real seriously and said, you're absolutely right. Mr. Bruner kept talking about Greek funeral art. Finally, Nancy Bobo Fit snickered something about the naked guy on the steel, and I turned and said, will you shut up? It came out louder than I meant it to, and the whole group started laughing. Mr. Bruner stopped his story. Mr. Jackson, did you have a comment? My face was totally red. I was like, no, sir. Mr. Bruner pointed to some of the pictures on the steel. Perhaps you'll tell us what this picture represents. I looked at the carving and felt a flush of relief because I actually recognized it. That's Kronos eating his kids, right? Yes, said Mr. Bruner, obviously not satisfied. And he did this because, well, I track, racked my brain to try to remember. Kronos was the king god and god, Mr. Bruner asked. Titan, I mean Titan, I corrected myself. And he didn't trust his kids who were the gods. So um, Kronos ate them, right? But his wife had a baby hit a baby named Zeus and he gave Kronos a rock to eat instead. And later, when Zeus grew up, he tricked his dad Kronos into barfing up his brothers and sisters. Ooh, said one of the girls behind me. And so there was this big fight between the gods and the titans, I continued, and the gods won. There were some snickers through the group. Behind me, Nancy Bobo Fit mumbled to a friend, like we're going to use this in real life. Like it's gonna stay on our job application, please explain why Kronos ate his kids. And why, Mr. Jackson, Mr. Bruner said, to paraphrase Miss Bobo Fitt's excellent question, does this matter in real life? Busted, Grover muttered. Shut up, Nancy said, her face even brighter red than her hair. At least Nancy got packed too. Mr. Bruner was the only one who ever caught her saying anything wrong. He had radar ears. I thought about his question. I shrugged. I don't know, sir. I see, said Mr. Bruno, looked disappointed. Well, half credit, Mr. Jackson. Zeus did indeed feed Kronos a mixture of mustard and wine, which made his disgorge his other five children. That's a little gross. I gotta say that right now. That's <laughs> just really gross. Who, of course, being immortal gods, had been living and growing up completely undigested in the Titan's stomach. The gods defeated their father, sliced him into tiny pieces with his own scythe, and scattered his remains in the Tartarus, the darkest part of the underworld. On that happy note, it's time for lunch. Miss Dodds, would you lead us back outside? The class drifted off, the girls holding their stomachs, the guys pushing each other around and acting like doofuses. Grover and I were about to follow, and Mr. Bruner said, Mr. Jackson, I knew what was coming. I told Grover to keep going, then I turned toward Mr. Bruner. Sir, Mr. Bruner had this look that wouldn't let you go. Intense brown eyes that could have been a thousand years old and had seen everything. You must learn the answer to my question, Mr. Bruner said, told me, about the Titans, about real life, and how your studies apply to it. Oh, what you learned from me is virtually, is vitally important. I expect you to treat it with such. I will accept you only the best from you, Percy Jackson. I will accept only the best from you, Percy Jackson. I wanted to get angry. This guy pushed me so hard. I mean, sure, it was kind of cool on tournament days when he dressed up in a suit of Roman art and shouted, what ho, and challenged us, sword point against chalk, to run to the board and name every Greek and Roman person who had ever lived and their mother and what God they worshiped and who they were. But Mr. Bruner expected me to be as good as everybody else, despite the fact that I have dyslexia and attention deficit disorder. 
and I have never made A's or B's or above a C in my life. No, he didn't expect me to be as good. He expected me to be better than everybody else. And I just couldn't learn all those names and facts like everyone else does, does much less spell them or write them correctly. I mumbled something about trying harder while Mr. Jacks, Mr. Bruner had took one long, sad look at the steel like he'd been at the girl's funeral. He told me to go outside and eat my lunch. The class gathered on the front steps of the museum where we could watch the foot traffic along Fifth Avenue. Overhead, a large storm was brewing with clouds blacker than I'd ever seen over the city. I figured maybe it was like global warming or something like that because the weather all across New York State had been weird since Christmas. We'd had massive snowstorms, flooding, wildfires from lightning strikes. I would have been surprised if there was a hurricane blowing in right now. Nobody else seemed to notice. Some of the guys were pelting pigeons with Lunchable crackers. Nancy Bobo Fit was trying to pickpocket something from a lady's purse, and of course, Mrs. Dodds wasn't seeing any of that. Grover and I sat on the edge of the fountain away from everyone else. We thought that maybe if we did that, everybody wouldn't know we were from that school, the school for loser freaks who couldn't make it elsewhere. Detention, Grover asked. Nah, I said, not for Bruner. I just wish he'd lay off me sometimes. I mean, I'm not a genius. Gerber didn't say anything for a while. Then when I thought he was going to give me some deep philosophical comment to make me feel better, he said, can I have your apple? I didn't have much of an appetite, so I let him take it. I watched the stream of cabs going along Fifth Avenue and thought about my mom's apartment, only a little ways uptown from where we sat. I hadn't seen her since Christmas. I wanted so bad to jump in a taxi and head home. She'd hug me and be glad to see me, but she'd be disappointed too. She'd send me right back to Yancey, remind me that I had to try even harder and that this was my sixth school in six years being expelled from. And I was probably going to be kicked out again. I wouldn't be able to stand that sad look she gave me. Mr. Bruner parked his wheelchair at the base of the handicap ramp. He ate celery while he read a paperback novel. A red umbrella stuck up from the back of his chair, making it look like a motorized cafe table. I was about to unwrap my sandwich when Nancy Bobofit appeared in front of me with her ugly friends. I guess she'd gotten tired of stealing from the tourist and dumped her half-eaten lunch in Grover's lap. Oops, she grinned when she cooked her tea. Her freckles were orange and somebody had spray painted her face with liquid Cheetos. I tried to stay cool. The school counselor had told me a million times, count to 10, Percy, get control of your temper. But I was so mad, my mind went blank. I waved, roared in my ears. I don't remember touching her, but the next thing I knew, Nancy was sitting on her butt in the fountain, screaming, Percy pushed me. Mrs. Dodds materialized next to us. Some of the kids were whispering, did you see the water? Like it grabbed her. I didn't know what else they were talking about. All I knew was that I was in trouble again. As soon as Mrs. Dodds was sure her poor little Nancy was okay, promising to get her a new shirt at the museum gift shop, etc., etc. Mrs. Dodds turned on me. There was a triumphant fire in her eyes, as if I'd done something she'd been waiting for all semester long. Now, honey, I know I grumbled a month erasing workbooks. That wasn't the right thing to say. Come with me, Mrs. Dodds said. Wait, Grover yelled. I, it was me. I pushed her. I stared at him, stunned. I couldn't believe he was trying to cover for me. Mrs. Dodds scared Grover to death. She glared at him so hard, his whiskery chin trembled. I don't think so, Mr. Underwood, but you will stay here. Grover looked at me desperately. It's okay, man, I told him. Thanks for trying. Honey, now, Mrs. Dodds barked at me. Nancy Bobo Fitz smirked. I gave her my deluxe, I'll kill you later stare. Then I turned to face Mrs. Dodds, but she wasn't there. She was standing at the museum entrance, way at the top of the steps, gesturing impatiently for me to come on. How'd she get up there so fast? I have moments like that, when my brain falls asleep or something, and the next thing I know, I've missed something, as if a puzzle piece fell out of the universe and left me staring at a blank place behind it. The school's counselor and the doctor told me this was part of my ADHD, that my brain misinterprets things sometimes. I wasn't so sure about this time, though. I went after Mrs. Dodds. Halfway up the steps, I glanced back at Grover. He was looking pale, cutting his eyes between me and Mr. Bruner, like he wanted Mr. Bruner to notice what was going on. But Mr. Bruner was absorbed in his novel. I looked back up. Mrs. Dodds had disappeared again. 
She was now inside the building at the end of the entrance hall. Okay, I thought. She's going to make me buy a new shirt for Nancy at the gift shop. But apparently that wasn't the plan. I followed her deeper into the museum. When I finally caught up to her, we were back in the Greek and Roman section. Except for us, the gallery was empty. Mrs. Dodge stood with her arms crossed in front of a big marble frieze of Greek gods. She was making this weird noise in her throat, like growling. Even without the noise, I would have been nervous. It's weird being alone with a teacher, especially Mrs. Dodds. Something about the way she looked at the frizz, as if she wanted to pulverize it. You've been giving us problems, honey, she said. I did the same thing. I said, yes, ma'am. She tugged on the cuffs of her leather jacket. Did you really think you would get away with it? The look in her eyes was beyond mad. It was evil. She's a teacher, I thought nervously. It's not like she's gonna hurt me. I said, I'll, I'll try harder, ma'am. Thunder shook the building. We are not fools, Percy Jackson, Mrs. Dodds said. It was only a matter of time before we found you out. Confess and you will suffer less pain. I didn't know what she was talking about. All I could think of was that teachers must have found the illegal stash of candy I'd been selling at the dorm rooms. Or maybe they'd realized I got my essay on Tom Sawyer from the internet without ever reading the book. And now they were gonna take me away, my grade? Of course they were going to make me read the book. Well, she demanded, ma'am, I don't. Your time is up, she said. Then the weirdest thing happened. Her eyes began to glow like barbecue coals. Her fingers stretched, turning into talons. Her jacket melted into large feathery wings. She wasn't human. She was a shriveled hag with bat wings and claws and a mouth full of yellow fangs, and she was about to slice me to ribbons. Then things got even stranger. Mr. Bruner, who'd been out front of the museum for a minute, wheeled in the doorway of the gallery, holding a pin in his hand. What ho, Percy, he shouted and tossed the pin through the air. Mrs. Dodge lunged at me. With a yelp, I dodged and felt Talon slash the air next to my ear. I snatched the ballpoint pen out of the ear, but when it hit my hand, it wasn't a pen anymore. It was a sword. Mr. Bruner's bronze sword, which he always used on tournament days. Mrs. Dodd spun toward me with a murderous look in her eyes. My knees were jelly. My hands were shaking so bad I almost dropped the sword. She snarled, die, honey. And she flew straight at me. Absolute terror ran through my body. I did the only thing that came naturally. I swung the sword. The metal blade hit her shoulder and passed clean through her body as if she were made for water. Yes. Mrs. Dodds was a sandcastle in a power fan. She exploded into tiny yellow powder vaporized on the spot, leaving nothing but the smell of sulfur and a dying screech and a chill of evil in the air as if those two glowing eyes were still watching me. I was alone and there was just a ballpoint pen in my hand. Mr. Bruner wasn't there. Nobody was there but me. My hands were still trembling. My lunch must have been contaminated with some kind of magic mushrooms or something. Had I imagined this whole thing? I went back outside and it started to rain. Grover was sitting by the fountain, a museum map tinted over his head. Nancy Bobo Fit was standing there, soaked from her swim in the fountain, grumbling to her ugly friends. When she saw me, she said, I hope Mrs. Kerr whipped your butt. I said, who? Our teacher, duh. I blinked. We had no teacher named Mrs. Kerr. Asked Nancy what she was talking about. She just rolled her eyes and turned away. I asked Grover where Mrs. Dodds was. He said, who? But he paused first and he wouldn't look at me. So I thought he was messing with me. Not funny, man, I told him, this is serious. Thunder boomed overhead. I saw Mr. Bruner sitting under his red umbrella reading his book as if he'd never moved. I went over to him. He looked up a little distracted. Uh, that would be my pen. Please bring me your writing utensil in the future, Mr. Jackson. I handed Mr. Bruner his pen. I hadn't even realized I was holding it. Sir, where's Mrs. Dodds? I asked. He stared at me blankly. Who? The other chaperone, Mrs. Dodds, the pre-algebra teacher. He frowned, sat forward, looking mildly concerned. Percy, there is Mrs. no Mrs. Dodds on this trip. As far as I know, there has never been a Mrs. Dodds at Yancey Academy. Are you feeling all right? Oh, that was the end of chapter one. That was a good story. All right. Love y'all. Good night.